re recording this to the cloud week 12 week 11 part one and week 11 part two will be on collaborate collaboration and collaborative research part one's with Teron Wong who graduated from IU a couple of years ago really a little over a couple of years ago she's been working though for two years at Colby College in Maine near Waterville Maine Yes, north of, memory. north of Augusta, I think. Yes. Uh, okay, so kind of in the middle of the state, sort of, mm -hmm. mid-central, sort of, where it's starting to warm up finally. They had a lot of cold weather over the weekend. It just uh, snowy today a little bit in the A little morning. bit. <laughs> we'll let you keep that snow. It, it was nice here. <laughs> and so, Tehran minored in IST and majored in LCLE, language and culture and literacy education or literacy culture and language education might be a better way of saying it. Okay. Yeah. And I was on her dissertation committee. I was highly impressed with the, her dissertation project. And she's gotten a lot of good feedback on it. A chapter in my book that I'll talk about after break, transformative teaching around the world stories of cultural impact, technology integration, and innovative pedagogy that I do with Maina Jube. She has a, one of the 42 main chapters in the book. I asked her to present a little bit on her dissertation so you could see what goes into a dissertation presentation for maybe 10 or 12 minutes, not necessarily the whole dissertation presentation. And she also gives some tips about communicating with your committee and a good dissertation defense. So um, Tehran, can you tell us um, what courses that you had when you were a graduate student here that were most beneficial to you in terms of conducting research? Can you remember any of them? Methods class, of course. <laughs> yeah, and the, all the seven level courses too. Yeah, because those what? those um, courses I uh, did um, original uh, research studies, which I learned a lot, and professors give me feedback on my what, research project. What method cl class? <laughs> I, I took um, critical ethnography with uh, Dr. Carl Specken. And or, originally I used that method in my dissertation, but I switched. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, I also took narrative inquiry. Um, uh, I wanted to take this course analysis because I heard that's a really good one, but I didn't get a seat. So I ended up not, not taking that. <laughs> Oh, you missed a good one then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us since you've left IU, maybe tell us about a study that you've conducted or are thinking about conducting. What's something you have planned? Oh, that's a great question. Currently, I'm doing a project in my class. I teach writing at Kobe College, um, work a lot with uh, multilingual students um, and domestic students. So I'm currently doing a project about AI and uh, writing because. Uh, Artificial intelligence, especially um, ChatGPT, is influencing a lot of uh, the ways that writing, writing professors or writing teachers should think about their pedagogy um, instead of viewing it as a something as a we have to like uh, or uh, prevent students from plagiarism. I mean, I mean, there are a lot of discussions on that, but I encourage my students to use uh, ChatGPT in their writing. So, um, so we are. I'm planning a project on that. And apart from that, I am currently writing a, a more conceptual piece um, on hybrid ethnography. So. Uh, originally, I used critical ethnography, but because uh, of my dissertation, which is about uh, hybrid learning, so I kind of started to rethink the methodology itself and think about how we can um, uh, combine uh, the online or the physical and uh, how to think of them as integrated. Uh, so especially in the field of language education, there are not many discussions on that. So I'm currently writing a, a a conceptual piece about uh, how to uh, think about hybrid ethnography in the field of language education and also how to conduct research using that methodology. Okay, would you like to tell us um, a little bit about your dissertation project and what you did? Um, maybe show some slides and then afterwards you can give us the tips for how to present 
and tips on how to communicate. But I think it's better to just see it first and then the tips will make more sense, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me share my screen. I have a um, condensed version of my dissertation, <laughs> uh, the defense, but I will not, of course, go over all of them. I'll just uh, give you a, a glimpse of the, the study. So my dissertation topic is examining synchronous hybrid English learning for children in rural China, a hybrid ethnographic study. Um, a little background information, uh, English is a compulsory subject for all elementary students from grade three in China. However, there's a huge rural urban divide of primary English education because in some rural schools, they, they cannot uh, uh, find um, in English uh, professional English language teachers for uh, children. There is a great shortage, in, especially in um, rural and the uh, mountainous areas, which is one of the places that I am examining in my dissertation study. So uh, scholars talk about the rural urban divide, which looks like this. Uh, and one concept I think it's important to mention because many of my students are so-called left behind children. Um, uh, so it's, it's happening because of China's economic boom because there is a huge uh, migration of cheap rural laborers. They move to cities to work in, uh, work as blue collar jobs. So their children are left behind in the villages. Uh, and the limited and the, the parents cannot bring their children to cities because of the very strict uh, house code registration system, which limits the resources, educational resources that uh, rural children with rural household uh, registration can access. So that's why children ended up being left in the villages. So uh, actually, in my uh, study, I most of the population students I'm looking at are left behind children. And I, I'm actually still in contact with them. So a few days ago, I still uh, talked with one of the, uh, the, the, the students and he told me that he already started working in a, a, a suburban factory. So he dropped school. Uh, he's, he, is, he should be at um, ninth grade right now, but he and many of his cohort actually dropped school, which uh, makes me uh, feel very yeah, mixed feelings. Um, so my research questions, I, I'm interested in uh, the patterns of interaction in this hybrid um, language learning class. So what patterns of interactions do students and teachers employ in this remote Chinese elementary village school? And what are the patterns of online interaction? What are the patterns of face-to-face -face interaction? And the, the second question, I'm interested in seeing the students and teachers' pers perspectives on their experiences learning. Uh, this in this hybrid English learning program. So uh, I adopted two theoretical frameworks. The first one is from more from an um, uh, educational technology perspective, uh, Terry Anderson's mo model of interaction in distance learning. So uh, I won't give a detailed description of it here, but from the uh, diagram, you can see they focus on student content teacher interaction. Uh, and there is also student student interaction, teacher teacher interaction, and content content interaction. And I'm mostly looking at a uh, teacher and student because I'm more interested in um, human interaction rather than the content, uh, focusing on the content. And the second framework I draw from sociology studies, which is from um, uh, Irvin Goffman, uh, his framework of micro -socio sociology of face-to-face uh, -face interaction. The first concept I got is the backstage and front stage uh, interactions. So for instance, this when a person uh, is doing some preparation work. For instance, a teacher was preparing for a class. Maybe he was not very happy, <laughs> but backstage, uh, you know, he was uh, busy with the work and very pressured. But in front of the stage, when he is performing to the students, he of course looks very energetic, very happy, and uh, very passionate about what he is teaching. So that's just an example. Uh, but in Erwin Goffman, he used the uh, uh, example of a, a waiter. Uh, so. Another one from Irving Goldsman is the ratified and non ratified interaction. So and this is uh, uh, more related to the, uh, the norms in an interaction. Um, so methodology, I used hybrid ethnography, which is uh, very, yeah. So I'll interrupt for a second, just to, for my students who are watching this later, 
That's about all you need in terms of theory when you present your dissertation defense. She's cut some slides from here. Um, she was a PhD student, so it should be a little more theory maybe, but really you don't need much more than this. And, and, and if at all, some students kind of make their theory one slide even. But yeah, a couple of slides, two, three, four slides related to theory, and that's pr pretty much you, all you have to do. So, um, and here's Karen coming in from Houston. So I was just making the I was just making the point, Karen. And if you could go back to on a couple of slides here, so uh, Karen can see which what you were presenting. So when Sharon was presenting, she just discussed some of the basic theory involved, and she only had you know three slides: one to get the learner-learner interaction, learner-student, learner-instructor interaction as the ed tech framework, and then the other framework, her ethnographic framework that she went through or using Irvin Goffman. I, my point was. She, you know, don't need a lot of theory when you present your dissertation. You need just several slides to remind faculty what they read. They're going to forget the first 50 pages of your dissertation, which involves the theoretical framing. Um, they'll forget that because they've read the next 50 pages or 100 pages that relates to method and then discussion and so forth, which they're going to focus more on. And they've already covered the first 50 at the dissertation proposal meeting. And if that proposal meeting went well, they don't have to attend too much to the literature review at the dissertation defense. That being said, I had a dissertation defense this morning at 8 a.m. Wow. <laughs> uh, and that person passed. And looking at um, online proctoring systems and that kind of thing in, in higher education settings. It was an interesting one, and she did fabulous. We've already submitted a paper for a special issue, you know, based on that. Anyways, so Tarana, I've asked her to just briefly present this, then to go through her tips about communicating with her committee and tips about presenting. But I thought it'd be good to see a couple of, of slides. And Karen, you also noticed that none of the students from our 795 are with us yet that you know they are they're out having a good time outside in the sun somewhere or, <laughs> or they're going to show up later I'm, I'm sure um this is being recorded so they're all studying very studiously I'm sure um <laughs> so Tron you want to continue <laughs> yeah sure um I think that's a, a great point because you have to think about your audience for the defense of course you will have other attendees but your major audiences are the committee members they already read your work so that's why it has to be short and uh, condensed. Uh, so a little bit uh, introduction of my research site. It's uh, um, the hybrid English program is actually uh, conducted by a non-profit organization. And the class meets once a week, 40 minutes. Um, this school you can see in the picture is in a remote uh, mountain village in Guizhou province in Southwestern China. And this is a really a uh, multi-ethnic school. Tujia, uh, Miao, Dong, Han. There are four uh, different ethnicities in the school. One picture of the classroom, what it looks like. So these are the little microphones, and it looks like this. Because students don't have a, a computer access at home, so this hybrid uh, class are all like uh, collective. Students all go to the same classroom together, and there's a local classroom teacher there, and then the online English teacher joins remotely. So that's basically how it works. Uh, my participant student's online teacher, who is a uh, Han ethnicity, she's a full-time high, uh, high school English teacher in, China, uh, in Shanghai. And the local classroom teacher, she was a fifth grade math, math teacher because uh, there's no English teacher in the local school. So all the classroom teachers are from other backgrounds. So my data, I have observation, both online observation, on-site class uh, observation, documentation, including mobile chat, student work, and interviews. I conducted interviews with students and the teachers, both classroom teacher and online teacher. So my data analysis, I won't go into detail, but you see uh, for my research question one, I have these data sources, and then I specify what kind of analysis methods are there. And uh, question two, what are the data sources and how I'm analyzing them, so the analysis approach. Uh, so I, I created this table to have this um, summary of my data analysis method uh, in response to each research question. Tron, and, go, back, yes. go back a slide. One more. Back. One more. This one. Yeah. And so you, did you have a really thick data set that you had to sort through? And how did you make decisions about what data to analyze and what to skip over? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, 
I do have a lot of uh, data, which not including in my dissertation. And uh, I think um, because of my, um, I would say the, the major uh, data is uh, classroom observation. Uh, so I, a bit, when I analyze the patterns of the interactions, I noticed uh, if, if there are some outliers, I will probably exclude them. And because I also have to think about the connection between my uh, observation data and the interview data as the data triangulation. So uh, I think in terms of uh, when, when I think it's more holistically, like what are my purpose and how this data can be related to other data and how they uh, together can address my research question that helps with my decision making of what to exclude. Okay, uh, go to the next slide. Important? So this is really important and increasingly I see this in dissertations, this kind of table and in fact might be more expanded in some, what, some of them recently in terms of what data, what are the data sources, but this seems to be increasingly important to include. And it, when back in the day when I did my dissertation, we didn't necessarily see a table like this all the time. So I'd say in the last five years, mm, the majority of students have a kind of a, a summarize how they're going to get their data, what the data is going to be by research question, in effect. Go ahead. Next, next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my research question number one patterns of interaction. Firstly, I do uh, uh, this diagram showing the. Um, the portion, the time that is allocated to which type of interaction, for instance, online teacher and student uh, interaction takes the most part of the uh, interaction. And you can see the student student too, but really there is very little classroom teacher uh, interaction, both with the online teacher and student. And of course, in my interview, uh, in my second question, I explained why this happens. And so this uh, and brings also, up a good point here too, in that, we're analyzing data and usually it's descriptive and we have all those words that describe, but anytime you can create a compact visual that depicts what your data set is all about, that takes the data to the next level towards publication of that data. This is your unique contribution, if you will. People can readily understand what, what your data set is about or the explaining that data set. This morning, my student had 12 or 15 figures and we found a way to reconfigure them actually so that they'd be even better than the way she had them. But it was that was the highlight, I think, in some ways of her dissertation, trying to use different um, uh, figures to indicate the themes in the qualitative data uh, set that she had collected uh, for how to do online proctoring, what faculty's opinions were, and so forth. So this, you always want to think about what the unique contribution is in any study, even your dissertation, of course. So. Um, that's what I'm reading for. And some faculty will be reading for, and they'll say to themselves, what can she publish from this? What is possible? Well, there's a start right there. This is something no one else has. It's unique to your data set. That's what my point was. You can keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So I also analyzed more detailedly in terms of the specific interaction, for instance, online teacher, all student, well, online teacher with one student, classroom teacher with all students, classroom teacher with one student, online teacher with classroom teacher and student, student, and the three together. You can see there's really zero, the three together interacting, which is kind of interesting. And I also analyze the discourse features, sample activities. Uh, so in my dissertation, I have a lot of big examples, uh, spe specific this, uh, observation data. So Taran, um, you said you yeah. didn't take discourse analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. self you self taught, or, or did you bit. did you sit in and audit it or something? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I, I self taught a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you can see some of the keywords I said: ratified group, non ratified private talks. Um, so they, these are from the uh, urban governance framework. And uh, I have uh, I can talk more about it, but I removed that because I. <laughs> Uh, this is a condensed version. Um, so research question two, students' perceptions. So I divided it into student perception and uh, a teacher perception, a classroom teacher perception and online teacher perception. So as to student perception, uh, they think oh, the, the positive part is they are able to interact more with teachers or with peers. There is a more relax, relaxing learning atmosphere because the online is, the, the teacher is um, very encouraging. Uh, and the online teacher's gentleness. 
and they also mentioned specific challenges in terms of learning English as a new language, for instance, the English pronunciation, but they also used the first, their first language, which is uh, meant, uh, Chinese to help them learn, learn that. So I included a piece of uh, data here. You can see the English sentence, Chinese meaning, uh, the student's transliteration in terms of uh, uh, her annotation about how to pronounce the word. And uh, you can see there's really uh, some translanguaging part uh, of it, the Chinese character and then the, the and uh, other uh, resources that the students use to help learn the pronunciation. And second challenge is related to students' personal traits and backgrounds. Uh, they are very timid to speak and make mistakes. And there's, there's a, a specific data from Diana uh, from her, uh, this is uh, non ratified face to face interaction. And self regulation, this is mentioned a lot by the uh, teacher and also a student too, because um, students, they come from a very unique background. I mentioned in the beginning, the government termed them as left behind children and they don't have much home learning support and they 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 don't have this notion of self-regulation in terms of learning uh, or they're not familiar with that. Uh, and uh, the classroom teacher's perspective, he thinks that the challenge, for instance, the deterioration of rural family structure left many students without parental support, resulting in their rebellious and indifferent attitudes. So the, the classroom teacher, she's, he is from a, uh, the local community, but he used the word rebellious and indifferent to describe this, this generation of students because he thinks because um, of the China's economic development, the, the parents are far away. And he thinks the, the generational changes he observed is really uh, influencing the, the children a lot. And uh, challenges caused by distance teaching, emotional connections. The classroom teacher really wants the, there's more connection emotionally between the online teacher and the students. Uh, and the issues with administration and limitations in the rural village. Um, the, as to online teacher's perspective, she observed challenges, for instance, similar with the classroom teacher. She used the term rebellious, hard to manage. Uh, but her, her reaction is that I can insist my principle with gentle attitude. Uh, and she said I should not uh, adopt the so-called traditional old-fashioned stick teaching, which is adopted in the local school. Uh, the, the classroom teacher will use the, literally a, like a, a stick to punish children if they didn't behave well. So that, that is very old fashioned, the traditional teaching method. And in terms of collaboration with the classroom teacher, and she, uh, she also thinks there is some problem and challenges there and challenges caused by technology. Uh, those are backstage issues uh, rather than front stage issues. Uh, and school administration. So discussion and conclusion, um, I have three in total, uh, uh, but this is a whole chapter in my uh, dissertation. So the first one, different configurations of interactions among the teachers and students, including various online, on-site, ratified, non-ratified, backstage, front-stage interactions, um, which enhance students' learning experience. And affordances for the online teacher to be gentle and for students to feel relaxed to speak English, make mistakes, and use their first language resources and provide peer support are important for language learning, especially in a hybrid setting. Uh, so these are the affordances of the hybrid learning. And while the teachers agreed on the challenges related to the effects of being left behind on children's learning and attitudes, the divergence between the rural school culture and the long line teachers beliefs and pedagogy generated challenges for synchronous uh, hybrid English instruction in the context of the rural school. So I am currently, um, uh, I, I've submitted uh, a manuscript about online teacher beliefs, identity tensions specifically to teaching and teacher education. And I just got um, uh, the, the first round to, uh, review and got some uh, feedback. So that project is uh, de derived from this dissertation, especially this third conclusion. Uh, and, and that goes back to Kurt's suggestion. Like if when you have a, dis a dissertation in the defense, maybe uh, the committee members will ask you, what do you think about uh, what are some of the publications that can came out from your project? Uh, so uh, I revisited Anderson's model and I also built a, a, a new model uh, based on my dissertation uh, findings. 
uh, I think deep and meaningful learning, there is, uh, you have to consider mode form, the function and the role. So this is uh, ICT and face-to-face -face communication backstage plus front stage behavior and ratified, non-ratified participation and trying to build a model that uh, is, uh, can account for uh, the various aspects of the learning uh, that I observed in the setting. So Again, uh, again that's yeah. a possible paper based yeah. <laughs> on that model or the model you're producing. So you have your data set that's publishable, you know, and then you'll have um, this model and figures and frameworks, you know, that's publishable. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I didn't prepare, uh, in my defense, I have uh, implications for pedagogy, for research and for policy, but I didn't include it here, so. Uh, okay, yeah. that's also publishable, implication side, it might be more practical kind of paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now why don't you go and, and give us your tips, um, either, either you can start with either one, you have tips on communicating, tips on defending. Um, yeah. Uh, before she yeah. does that, Sunmei or Karen, do you have any questions for Sharon? Um, no, not right now. Okay. Oh, go. Karen, you can go first. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I said I said not right now. I'm good. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for you know giving this presentation. That's because actually my dissertation topic is peer interaction. So I'm really interested in everything. So can I get the, your yeah, dissertation paper? Maybe I can oh, yeah, sure. refer to some part. And also I have some questions. So you actually said that, you know, there was some, you know, interaction between students. How did you do that? So what did you provide for, you know, students? That's because I saw that there is a, physical classroom, but each student had, had, you know, just a computer and then maybe some devices, right? And then via yeah, yeah. some online tenum or? That's oh. a great question. Yeah, in my, in the English class, I observed there is not really student and the computer interaction. <laughs> They're all, when they oh. do, it's really feels like a face-to-face -face class when you have peer interaction, oh. you just discuss with them face-to-face. Um, because the online teacher didn't embed uh, like uh, technology uh, enabled um, like learning activities. Otherwise they can just use the computers in front of them. But that's what I observed in another com computer class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, students mm -hmm. will use the, com the laptop in front of them and also do uh, peer uh, activities uh, just uh, surrounding the, the laptop. But peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction is uh, always face-to-face uh, -face in this class. Oh. But the students also have a mobile chat. Uh, some of them, they, they chat after class in terms of uh, uh, many various uh, aspects of their lives and studies. So you mean they originally, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, communication among students, but actually they are using as well to mobile chat, right? And how did you, you know, just to count it? That's because I saw they usually online teacher to all students, uh, 80%, right? Mm -hmm, so parent, yeah. and then 22% of peer to peer interaction. So how to calculate them? That's because, you know, there is uh, no information. That's because it's just the physical interaction at a time. I, I don't know, just, just I'm curious how, oh, oh, how yeah. did you calculate that percent? Yeah, 20, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, like a cl one class is 40 minutes and the teacher, the online teacher is talking via Zoom, for instance. In, yeah. in China, they use a different app, but basically similar with Zoom. So, uh, when mm -hmm. the online teacher is interacting with students, I uh, will see like a, a whole uh, like learning event. I actually define my unit of analysis is a learning event. And I cited okay. a scholar who, who decided uh, like what, what is a learning event and basically one like the round of the, the discussion. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, if an online teacher uh, is talking with a student, talking with a, a, a one student that's counted as an online teacher 
and student interaction. But if the mm -hmm. online teacher is talking to all the, the whole class, that's online teacher versus all student uh, interaction, that's also counted as the 77% here. So uh, here I have a more detailed uh, mm. like time uh, time count. So the seventy seven oh, okay. is yeah. uh, is this one plus this one, the se first one plus the second one. So basically that's how I I counted that. Yeah, you went through really quickly, so I didn't <laughs> read everything. Yeah, you know, I, just I saw the percent. And another yeah, question yeah. is that you said that in your model deep and meaningful learning. So how did you define meaningful learning in this mm -hmm. situation? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think uh, especially in my, uh, it's not showing here, but um, mm. given the specific context of the study, especially if you think about um, learners who are with more non-traditional background, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, students who are um, probably uh, traditionally um, uh, marginalized for uh, mm -hmm. for instance the students in my setting it's important to understand their cultural background and the challenges they have uh, and especially their their learning habits and uh, their own dispositions in terms uh, towards learning and the particular how the cultural background influenced their learning that's why i adopted a hybrid ethnography because i'm interested in seeing mm -hmm how their own culture is influencing their learning behavior in the setting. So that's why uh, uh, in the previous model by Anderson, he didn't touch upon culture. And that's mm -hmm. what I am interested in. He just say deep and meaningful learning is uh, teacher student content. Uh, he said, um, all these are important, uh, but uh, the student teacher uh, interaction is most important because that's uh, you know, the teacher giving feedback or things like that. But for from my model here, I think, uh, as you can see, the backstage and the non-ratified things are are things that are more relevant to the implicit culture that is being adopted by the participants. That's why I really want to emphasize uh, uh, this hidden part, this implicit part, uh, how the culture is influencing uh, learning. So in order to facilitate deep, deep and meaningful learning, we have to really think about what's not, uh, visible, not visible for us within the classroom setting, but more out of classroom setting. So uh, th that would be how I define deep and meaningful uh -huh. learning. Yeah, that's a great Yeah, question. Yeah, that's because their one is actually abstract meaning. That's because I think that that's really subjective. That's because some people say that, you know, once students get a 100% of a score, you know, at that time, oh, that's really meaningful learning that students did or something like that, right? Which really number they stick. At that time, oh, I can understand, right? I got it, yeah, maybe. But, you know, usually as for the other meaning, so it's really hard. That's because mm -hmm. I went through the same thing. So it's really hard to meaningful learning. That's because mm -hmm. always, so we, we just to count to the number of something that's not enough, I think. So maybe usually we, you know, listen to the, you know, participants and then we define, oh, actually they did really meaningful learning. At the time, I have to say that what meaningful learning is. So I'm yeah. just curious, uh, yeah, what yeah, you yeah. define and maybe I can, yeah, listen yeah. to Karen, that. Karen took okay, off thank her, you. Um, Karen took off her okay. microphone. So I wonder if Karen has a question. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I'm actually looking at um, basically, you know, the curriculum and how the curriculum was designed, I guess. Um, you said on there that there's yeah, very minimal communication between the online teacher and the in-person face-to-face right. teacher. I'm wondering if it's there's minimal communication during class versus you know when they when they decided on the syllabus or the curriculum for the class where there was more communication there and if that was considered in your in your data or is it that that's that part is not considered or or what uh, that's a great question too that's also a question i have keep probing in this project uh because the teacher both classroom teacher and the online teacher work for this uh hybrid learning for voluntary so they're not get paid and uh, and the uh, the classroom teacher is not expert in English language teaching. He's a math oh. teacher, and um, 
so the originally the curriculum, um, especially the uh, the school, both the school and the uh, um, the online the, the program wanted more in collaboration between the two teachers, but it didn't really work well because uh, there is no, I guess, intrinsic both intrinsic and extra, uh, motivation for for especially the, the local teachers to work um, for this. They they mostly they just um, do classroom. The collaboration is at classroom management level rather than curriculum level because mm -hmm. firstly the classroom teacher doesn't didn't think that he's uh, he can contribute because he doesn't teach English. <laughs> Secondly, is also because um, there are many structural constraints. Uh, he is re really busy. Uh, and one thing I, one in pedagogical suggestion I mentioned in the uh, dissertation study is that even if the, the, for instance, the teacher is not interested in the subject of English, but in terms of pedagogy, they can collaborate uh, because the, in this uh, local school, uh, the teaching, the pedagogy is really um, oh, traditional, like teacher-centered, and the classroom uh, management is very, like I mentioned, the stick teaching is the, the word that they use. Uh, uh, so uh, if they can collaborate and they can learn how the online teacher is uh, approaching teaching, uh, like innovative uh, pedagogies or how, uh, how she um, design a student-centered classroom. I think if they can both have uh, this consensus like recognizing student-centered learning is important and the, the classroom teacher can uh, learn from the online teacher or from the collaboration um, in terms of pedagogy innovation. I think that will work better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm yeah. not sure if this addresses your question. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah. So, Thank you. Toronto, I have two things before you move on to mm -hmm. your other slides. One, I had the false impression when you told me about your study long ago, and then when you came back from China, that you were embedded in the school for a long period of time, like a couple of my students have in the past. Right, right, not, right. You were not embedded in the school for a long period of time. Can you tell us just so we can get, people will watch this later, they might sure. not understand that yeah. you flew in and, and you maybe stayed at a hotel for a weekend or maybe a couple <laughs> weekends and stuff like that. But the kids really loved you and wanted you to come back because they had interacted with you, I think, before you got there. So there's a long, but there's a backstory right. to all of this that you know, we haven't seen. And as part of that, could you show some pictures of the kids? You you cut those slides out, but can you can you go to the slides that have the pictures of the kids in the school and all that and talk about that a little bit and your yeah, role yeah. within the school embedded That's or not? Yeah, so that's a great question. I should have mentioned that. So the chapter I wrote for your book, uh, that one is based on my own teaching experience. So actually I worked with this project for many years and I, every summer I go back to China to, different, to visit different schools to learn about uh, their needs. So the, I used to teach for a school in southeastern China and then central China. This school is in southwestern China. I purposefully choose to study this school because I don't want to study my own class. It, it's getting complicated if you're doing that. And I also want to observe, being able to observe. So I choose this school because I know this online teacher very well. And she talked with me a long time ago in terms of the challenges she encountered, especially in terms of uh, uh, she, uh, she doesn't understand much about her students' background. And uh, also in terms of the challenges she had with, in terms of collaboration. So I said, yes, then I'm going to definitely uh, study your class because I will visit there and I will also see uh, what our students' real, the lives really look like. And I can give uh, her more insider perspective. Uh, so the chapter I wrote for you is, uh, your book is uh, actually is a Southeastern Chinese school, that the school I have been voluntarily teaching for one and a half years. Uh, and this school I didn't teach online, but when I was um, uh, doing ethnographic work there, I stayed at the, the place. Uh, so I didn't stay in the village, but I stayed in a, a, a hotel, like when I would drive every day, the, the local teacher, uh, he drove me from, my, uh, from where I stay and to the school because he also stays nearby. 
and I stayed there for uh, one and a half month and uh, uh, yeah, I visited there every day. And when I was working, uh, when I was doing the observations, I also teach for another grade. So this, this class is in the fifth grade and the local teacher said, can you teach, uh, help teach uh, the fourth grade um, on site because we never had an on site like a per in person English teaching class. So I taught there for almost one month uh, in the summer different class. Yeah, in the summertime. Can you show the picture summer. in the in the classroom? Oh yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So the, so they're basically Karen and and Sunne yeah. and Jion, they're streaming in instruction vir virtually through synchronous technologies from other cities um using expats as teachers or those in 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 shanghai or could be in other cities so the, they have limited english instruction in the schools in these central uh chinese or southeast chinese or western chinese northwestern chinese rural school districts so Tehran's in working with kids in rural schools who don't whose parents might have gone to the bigger cities and are the, they're, they're being left behind and raised by grandparents. And as part of that, uh, they're trying to provide additional educational opportunities through a nonprofit organization uh, in various nonprofits. She was working with one of the nonprofits. There are others as well. And so um, Tehran decided to explore this, not only teach within it, but then do a, a, a pilot and then a dissertation uh, from that. And um, she was... In, she did work embedded for a month during the summer, but during the dissertation itself, she was not embedded. She was just observing, right? And yes, so, yes. Um, yeah. So that's why I wanted to clarify that. And in case someone's watching this later, I I asked Charon to show a brief bit of her dissertation, and then we've commented on it, um, Ji Young. So um, we're going to go to her tips now. But is there any other is there any other people slides you want to show us or anything else? I I removed from this version, but uh, <laughs> you don't have the I, old version available. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This so, new version. Yeah. So we've got about twenty minutes left or so. So you want to give us your tips? Be yeah, and then I'll take over and talk about collaboration and research teams. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Charon. Sure. Uh, I have some tips on defending a dissertation. Uh, so I defended in December 2020. Um, uh, so before the defense, um, it's really important that you read your dissertation. Uh, you know, either you prefer print it out or just uh, read it um, online. But it's important that I read at least, I couldn't remember, but I think I read at least twice. Uh, just to, uh, because it's a long document and you don't know what, uh, sometimes you don't know who are going to ask what questions and uh, it's always good if you can, uh, during the defense, always uh, give some specific uh, examples uh, in order to defend yourself. And it's That's good for I your faculty it. to read your dissertation too. And I will say that some faculty will read it a month ahead of time and some will read it the night before. The majority of people read it the night or two nights before, not everybody. And so actually there's some conscientious faculty will read it a month in advance and they'll forget a lot of that, what they've read. Um, and it might not look like they've read, but they actually have. And, you know, so there's variations and strategies for reading the dissertation. It's usually when time allows you know, so I'm sorry, Tron, go ahead. Oh, no problem. Uh, and practice your presentation. I remember my advisor, she um, practiced me uh, with me once uh, online. My first version of the, the dissertation slides, I thought I can finish it uh, within 30 minutes. She gave me 30 minutes, uh, but I know some other advisors, depending on their requirement, maybe shorter, like 20 minutes or even shorter. But she uh, wanted me to finish it within 30 minutes. And I practice it. It's uh, way more than 30 minutes. It really helped uh, the mock defense. Um, and presentation design, uh, you're all from IST. I'm pretty confident uh, that you you're have good design. Um, presentation de delivery, think about the time, the fluency, um, and anticipate questions. Uh, I think you can prepare some questions and there's a high chance that uh, many questions, um, if you prepare, you know, there's overlap between what you prepared and what will be asked. 
and wear something you feel comfortable with in which you feel like yourself. Some people prefer to wear something uh, really formal. And if you're comfortable with that, feel free to do that. But for me personally, if I wear something which is very different from uh, my uh, everyday uh, uh, clothes, then <laughs> I probably feel a little awkward. <laughs> and uh, But uh, depending on your style. Uh, but as long as you, you feel comfortable, it's fine. Uh, attend other people's defense. This really helped a lot. I learned a lot from attending other people's defense in terms of the way they deliver uh, the presentation, the way they address um, committee members' questions um, and research your committee members. Uh, especially if you attend other people's defense with who um, those defense has the committee members with your committee I have some overlaps that really helped because I noticed some patterns certain um, faculty members like to ask similar questions across different uh, dissertation defenses and I take notes on that uh, because I know oh probably he or she will ask the same question in my defense too and also your uh, uh, committee members background for instance um, I have a committee member uh, she was really uh, expert in teacher uh, professional development. So I kind of know that she will ask a question about a teacher aspect, the teacher professional development aspect. So, and during the defense, she did ask uh, questions related to that. So if you know your uh, committee members expertise, of course, they, they will uh, ask things that they are more interested or they are, um, you know, related to um, their background as well. So those are the things you might consider. And possible questions, think about uh, in another way. Uh, will your professor, uh, your committee member might ask you about uh, clarification for a certain theoretical framework, uh, your interpretation or the way you and use it to analyze it, or the method. I see a lot of people ask method, and uh, this is um, really a, a big uh, like portion of uh, questions being asked. Uh, method is really important with, uh, to ensure that you did the research rigorously and your analysis as well, findings and discussion. Implications, there are both theoretical and practical implications. Um, if you are, uh, especially for PhD defense, you don't want to just talk about practical implications. You want to move your, push your project further into a more um, uh, academic or theoretical level. Um, and question types, uh, certain questions are easier to tackle. For instance, explanation and clarification questions, because you wrote it, you know it, you did the study. Uh, these type of questions I think are easier to answer, especially if you read your dissertation beforehand, just the, the night before your defense, like if your committee member will say, oh, on page X, Y, Z, you, you mentioned this, can you tell me more about it? Can you clarify on this concept? Uh, because you know them already. So these are easier to answer. And reflections on the past, for instance, if you were to do this project again, what would you do differently? This is also to think about your um, you know, reflexivity as a researcher. We all have uh, uh, you know, things we probably think we can do better, uh, and both in terms of our research design or the data collection or data analysis or the writing part. So um, think about the different pieces or different stages you were doing the project and reflect it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if you if you address this question, really think about yourself as a researcher and have your reflexivity, then I think you will address this question very well. And future plans, for instance, what publications do you plan to work on based on this dissertation? So, uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Bank already mentioned this. Um, so think about how different pieces uh, of your dissertation work or different angles, different aspects uh, you can address. Either it's for, from a student's perspective, uh, teacher perspective, or um, you know, the different uh, things, or even methodology. Um, the real defense question, these are mo the most challenging part, I would say. So especially what you have omitted or the important things you should have address, addressed but not. So uh, normally, if you encountered this question, uh, you know, you have to, um, firstly, I would say, address, uh, thank the committee member and say, oh, that's a really great question. That's a great concern. And uh, you want to say, 
justify why you didn't include certain things? Um, you know, is it because of uh, you already address it as a limited scope for, uh, uh, or your rationale for purposefully choosing certain pieces uh, or the, omit other pieces? Um, and um, think about uh, ways to justify that. But if you think, uh, and you, you will also uh, think if, if you can, or if you want to add it uh, to your next revision. Uh, so uh, I would say, depending on the specific nature of your project, uh, uh, you have to, to balance uh, how you want to revise it uh, based on the faculty member's uh, suggestion. And during the- Sharon, can you go back a slide? So that that for no go go where you know where you were the the the, the, the uh, one this one there you, yeah okay. right so the top question is what I used to be known for asking about the literature review and page numbers in it and students used to make fun of me at the IST follies but now I asked number two and number three and I and we had a dissertation defense today at eight o'clock this morning and I asked number two and number three. I can tell you what different faculty will ask if, if you're interested, Jiun, uh, Jiung. Um, I can tell you what Dr. Kwan will ask, and I, I don't know what all of them will ask, but I've got a sense of things. Um, but I'll focus on limitations, future directions, and plans for publication. Um, some faculty, though, the one you don't have on here is the so what question. A lot of faculty get focused and just say, so what? So what does this mean? So you know, what do, can we take away from this? What makes this unique? And as I may have said last week, I think I did, or two weeks um, before break, I had one student that um, Dr. Marty Siegel asked her a question, the so what question, so what, you know, what does it mean? And her dissertation ended up being so important. It got in, in trade books. I mean, the findings of it, so there's a lot. She, she had huge implications to her study that, you know, got in the general knowledge and in, in the newspaper and all. So have, have an answer for why you did the study. What is the, what is the implication of it, right? The so what question, what are, what are the takeaways of this research and so forth? So that's a common question. Future directions and planning possible publications. That's a definite question you'll get somewhere along the way. Um, you can go ahead, Sharon. Okay. Um, during the defense, put yourself in a good mood. Think before you respond, because certain questions, of course, out of your expectation. Uh, I prefer to um, just pause for a little bit if, if this question is really, uh, because sometimes a faculty member might ask you, a, like, a, speaking a long time and ask you a double barrel question. <laughs> You know, a good question, of course, is a short question. It's easy to remember, but of course, they have to explain why they come up with this, this conclusion, what makes them to ask this question. So there's a lot of explanations before they ask the real question. The, some, sometimes you need to really put together your thoughts. If you feel that's necessary, you can just um, think about it a little bit before you respond. But sometimes you can also, uh, some people will prefer to uh, kind of using their response as a brainstorming technique. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, don't ramble too much if you if you would adopt that that approach because um, I think um, a good response from my perspective is also like uh, writing an academic um, paper. Sometimes you you start with a. a like a statement, your claim, and then you use specific evidence to support your claim. So you want both at something at a more um, abstract level, but also with some specifics uh, so that uh, your, your claims or your answers are really well justified. And accept your nervousness, but do not be too nervous. Uh, here, I have a question. How many defense theory stories have you heard? There might be some, but definitely not like the most part of it. So I use it to, to make myself uh, feel more comfortable and less nervous, I would say, yes, uh, there is a higher chance I would definitely get past. So <laughs> why should I get nervous? And ask clarification questions when the question is unclear to you. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions, ask clarification questions. Um, and thank committee members for their great questions. Then follow up with your uh, structured response. Uh, recognize their thoughts, questions, 
concerns and suggestions and then tell them how you have addressed them or how you will address them. Uh, so speak directly to, to their uh, suggestions or concerns. Um, and don't take critical comments personal. Uh, if they, of course, they are, you are, they are commenting on their, your work rather than you as a person. So uh, keep that in mind. If you, if you, if you are the kind of person who is a little hesitant or afraid of critiques, sometimes I was, I will think a lot if I really receive a lot of uh, criticism. But I know those are for the benefits of improving my work rather than um, personally. For instance, if you get. Uh, you know, response from, from a manuscript you submitted. I always hesitant, hesitate to open the document and read the reviewer comments because I, I just don't want to see those critics, but those are helpful. And um, so uh, I, I originally had the slide about communicating with advisor, uh, but I think, um, I don't think I've uh, included in this version. So uh, in terms of communication with your community members, I would say, uh, be clear about, uh, like you can talk with them, ask your advisor their preference on the frequency and the method of communication. Some advisors will, will say, oh, we can meet uh, once a week or twice a week, uh, like ask them uh, and ask them their expectations on the communication because some, uh, advisors, they will expect you to write something before the meeting. My advisor, um, she wanted me to prepare to, to write something before uh, ahead of the meeting, and she will review the first few pages of that. Um, so we have something specific to discuss during the meeting. But some advisors, they might prefer different styles. So it's, it's uh, always good to make that clear in the beginning. Uh, make a consensus and finish your work early so that you can give your advisor time to read your work and provide feedback. So committee members are always be the, your advisor. So it's it's really uh, important that you um, you finish the work on time and uh, give them some time to read and provide feedback. Chua? And if they don't, yes. And if they don't finish that comment, <laughs> oh, I have a very last comment. If they don't reply your email, just send them a gentle reminder. That, that's it. <laughs> and, and, and I do have your slides. So if you take the slides share off, I, I can call mm -hmm. up your slides for the next uh, part here, um, I think. Uh, so hang on a second. So you were, you were on data collection right there, right? Oh, Sharon? yes, that's one, yeah. So I do have those. Here, if you want to talk about briefly, we have a couple of minutes before I want to go in here. So, okay. which of these you want to make uh, any comments on? Uh, equipment's very important. I the first first observation I realized that my the the camera the battery doesn't last. I had to buy another battery, and the the delivery is really hard because I was in a remote area. It took a long time to for the battery I ordered online to be delivered. Always good to get multiple copies of your data because you don't know <laughs> if something will happen. <laughs> you want to keep multiple copies, at least two copies, as I mentioned here, and um, always good to collect more data than less data. Mm. Yeah, either uh, I mean more more is always better. Um, and um, yeah, I'll go to the next slide. I think we have. Um, yeah, 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 sure. I think this is your last slide. Right. I think I talk about these first four points, and the last point, maybe. Uh, so now thinking uh, back at this point, uh, I might. Um, I think it might depend on your situation because uh, sometimes you might just ask your dissertation chair for most of the time and you don't have to talk with uh, the rest of the community unless uh, you get some uh, you know, suggestion from the your chair saying, oh, that, that faculty member has certain expertise. You can talk with them in terms of updating your literature on certain aspects or certain theory. Uh, but I would say uh, uh, the committee chair is, of course, the person you, you always communicate the most. Um, mm -hmm. and Send the, the reminders. Of, uh, yeah. 
Send reminders. Okay, I'm gonna stop the sharing then. If um, Does anyone have a question for Tron um, before we transition over? So is this in person or virtual in your case? Uh, the time I defended is a uh, virtual defense. It, okay. it was uh, 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID. So I just the heart of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember your proposal meeting face to face. Yeah, but I, yeah. I don't remember quite the defense. I remember meeting you afterwards at Lenny's for a celebration with masks on. Oh, yes, I remember that too. <laughs> <laughs> Outside at Lenny's yeah. with the heat lamps. Other comments? Uh, thank you for presenting that, Charon. I mean, it's really helpful going through that and just, you know, communicate, be, you know, gentle nudges back and forth and you know, you'll you'll be amazed at what just little communications here and there, you know, positive, positive communications here and there, you know, and some redundancy has to exist. You have to be a little bit redundant. And back to when you talked about presenting your slides, remember direct eye contact is good. Remember, don't look at the slides too much. You can go, turn back and look at your slides, but I recommend practicing with your machine turned around you know, or at a, at a distance of 10 to 10 to 15 feet in front of you so you have to really stretch your eyes just to read what's on the screen so you're not you know see it's there as a teleprompter so that you want to have the technology be in front of you like a teleprompter like the, the president of the united states or something you just see, seeing the monitor off in the distance and and so forth can help them but they're speaking to the whole audience out there they're not speaking to the machine they're not speaking to the to the the overhead projector or the screen behind them or whatever exists back behind them they're 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 talking and making a conversation a casual conversation a confident casual conversation and that's why Charon said to practice you want to be confident that you know what's coming next you know, want to say oh what was I about to say there oh what was it you want to know it you want to review you don't have to read the whole dissertation the night before because you know but you want to review the whole thing and and you might read different parts I mean I go back, I still go back to my dissertation and read it different pages. And I'm, you know, I'm surprised at certain things I've written. I mean, we all have that syndrome that comes when, oh, that's really junk or that's really good, you know, or whatever, you know, that 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 happens to all of us where we, we revisit our own text. So I'm going to stop the recording on part one in, unless there's any other comments. Maybe we should all give a round of applause here first and just say thank you, Tron. And and I'm gonna, I don't even think we need a break here at this point. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording for part one.